language was the result of a long and complicated evolutionary process, a process that gave rise to a qualitatively new being, the human. Language expressed thought, something uniquely human. An increasing population faced with a decreasing supply of food, forced the first people to raise their level of cooperation. And they began to have something to say. These early humans began a journey that would have as its aim mastery over nature itself. In einem kaum wahrnehmbaren Zeitraum werden Gedanken in Worten ausgedrückt. I suoni privi di significato chiamati fonemi si combinano in morfemi, cioè units of meaning, the simple words from which a complex language is formed. Miles o quizás cientos de miles de palabras. Los hombres y las mujeres se llenan de adilipetes. Y los antropitos y los milanes se pones de afuertes. Cuál es el adlán? A fof que le duen. Pero en cada una de ellas, on puede exprimir las mismas pensamientos. Language is not the only form of human communication. Our thoughts can be expressed in many different ways. Despite the rich variety in the forms of human expression, the main and most reliable means of communication is language. After E, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Be careful, there's a long, long... It's a long fourth beat. Before the birth of man, no animal had language. It was the humans, highest product of millions of years of evolutionary process, who invented language. Only humans created the word as a symbol for real phenomena, for concrete reality. Only people can combine meaningless sounds into words with meaning. And I think it's very misleading to use the word language for what whales do and dolphins do and bees do and everything else without belittling the importance of their commu communication system, which I think are very great. Uh, humans do something which is radically new and radically different. I think one of man's most significant points of departure from the rest of the animal kingdom is in the development of spoken language. Only people use language, but animals do communicate with each other. This may be as simple as a display of aggression. It may be as complex as the dance of a honeybee that instinctively transmits the location and distance of a source of pollen.
Animal communication is a set of limited signals transmitted to express their instinctive feelings at the moment. Even the apes, our closest relatives on the evolutionary chain, have not developed language. Well, the chimpanzee has a very rich variety of postures and gestures and calls that he uses when communicating with his fellows uh, within the community and between communities for that matter. Some of these postures and gestures are very similar to our own, reaching out the hand, begging, um, crouching and bowing, patting on the back, kissing. These things are all very like human communication patterns. A chimp may learn to associate a particular call with an individual chimp, or the sound of a call with a specific activity. It can recognize the call of the baby and distinguish whether it is in danger or at play. But this, to me, is very different from human spoken language. When an animal cries out, it expresses its instinctive feelings. These can elicit in another animal an instinctive response, an involuntary reflex. Voluntary reflexes also play a role in animals. In itself, the barking of a dog means nothing to a beaver. But through experience, the beaver can learn to associate the bark with danger. The bark takes on the value of a signal for a factor that relates to an instinctive need. In this way, animals orient themselves to the external world and adapt to it. This horse performs a trick in response to a trainer's cue. Yes, yes, yes. Good boy. Good kiss. Oh, nice one. In itself, the trainer's cue means nothing to the animal. The signal only has meaning when associated with something related to instinct. In this case, the reward of food. To the horse, if the food is not offered, in time the trainer's cue will lose its meaning. The signal means nothing in itself. The sight and sound of a storm can cause a dramatic emotional response in human or animal. But for humans, a word once learned is a signal that takes on meaning in itself. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow. Just by hearing the words, a person can experience emotions as if one had actually perceived the storm the word, as an abstract symbol for concrete reality, is one of the things that makes human language unique. We have evolved this spoken language. It enables us to discuss ideas, to make coherent plans for the future based on a remembered past. And this, I think, puts us in a different category of being to chimpanzees. People draw general conclusions from life, develop theory about how the world operates, and can guide their actions accordingly. But all this requires words. Can abstract thought exist without language? Through language, we make our ideas real for others. But not only that, through language, we make ideas real for ourselves. Can we make sense of what we perceive without using words?
Symbolic thought and language are dependent on each other for existence. Does this mean that language must be as old as thought itself? The relationship of thought and language can be seen in the mental development of a child. The thinking of a child, up to the age of one or two years old, is limited to what the child perceives directly in a concrete manner, what is seen, heard, felt. As the child grows older, symbolic thought develops side by side with language. From almost the moment of birth, babies communicate. But this communication is much like that of animals, an expression of instinctive feelings and desires. It is principally an involuntary response. Several months into life, most babies develop the ability to communicate with deliberate vocal and physical gestures. The baby begins to use signals to influence the people around it, to express its wants and desires. Around nine or ten months old, the baby begins to refer to specific objects by pointing. This is usually accompanied by a deliberate vocalization, and the baby begins to learn its first words. Babies begin to learn words for things. They begin to think symbolically. You can find it. There he is. Great. Let's try again. You see if you can find him. You see if you can find him. All gone. All gone, yes, he's all gone, but where is he? And these kinds of words that they start using after 18 months, like all gone and uh, uh oh and there for success and failure really seem to involve talking to yourself instead of talking to someone else. They really involve the child using language to regulate his own behavior. So you find children from languages all over the world learning different languages, having some word like gone or all gone that gets used when an object can't be seen. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Under there, yes, we'll put him under there. And if you think about it, that's a pretty abstract kind of idea to have, the idea of saying, I can't see something. As the babies attempt to solve more complex problems, they begin to make simple conclusions from their observations. Even at this early stage, thought and words cannot be separated. Uh-oh. Oh, it's not going on, is it? So that for things like tool use, you need to be able to think at a certain level of abstraction. You see that happening with children, and in children, that moment of saying, okay, I could use this for something other than the things that I've used it for before, is connected with their being able to use language in particular ways. And what happens is that language is this great tool that allows us to take advantage of all the millions of years of experience that all of our grand ancestors have had. A greater part of a person's knowledge comes from others, from the experience of the whole of human society. Language is the principal storehouse for the collective knowledge of all humanity. Even a primitive stone tool implies knowledge handed from generation to generation. A tool embodies the experience of all the people who have gone before. <laughs> Uh, 
The more complex these tools became, the more people relied on language for passing on this experience. In the course of their productive activity, people discovered different qualities of nature and developed words to express this knowledge. And so it is today. With each advance in human productive ability comes new understanding of natural laws and with it, new words to express this understanding. The Oxford English Dictionary has added an average of 400 new words per year, more than 30,000 in the last 75 years. Language is the creation of human productive activity. While language is uniquely human, that hasn't stopped some people from trying to get animals to speak. There have been attempts to teach apes to talk, but without much success. Vicky, Vicky, do this. Do this, Vicky. That's good. Do this. No, no, do this. This experiment was conducted in the 1940s at Penn State University. Another letter is another sound resembles the letter K. Vicky, sit up, girl. Do this. Vicky has to hold her hand over her nose to do this sound. Come be a good girl. Now do this. That's right. Another Apes don't sound. speak. There's nothing wrong with the tongue or the Vicky, larynx or anything like this that would prevent them making sounds which could be used in a language, uh, but they just don't do it. Furthermore, they, they don't do it in the most obstinate manner. I mean, people have made tremendous efforts to get chimpanzees particularly, but other monkeys too, uh, to make meaningful noises, and they won't do it. Can you say what this is? Speech requires more than the ability to make noises. It requires the human brain and human consciousness. Now what humans do when they put the sounds together is to make short, meaningless sounds and combine them into words. Well, what none of these animals do is use a pattern of meaningless sounds in order to get to meaning. The, all these animals score zero. Some researchers thought that a language made up of manual gestures might be more suited to the apes' natural abilities and attempted to teach them American Sign Language, a language made up of hand gestures. It was hoped this work would shed light on the origin of human language. One of the studies is being carried out by Dr. Lynn Miles with an orangutan named Chantek. One way we can try to understand the origins of language is to use the ape as a model of what our ancestors may have been like, both in their langu language ability and in their cognitive skills. We've discovered that apes can put their signs together in novel combinations. Uh, most of these are usually only two or three signs long, but the ape in a very rudimentary way is able to communicate about the here and now, experiences that would be important, say, to a, a two or three year old human child. We've also made an interesting discovery. 
although in many ways Chantek is similar to a human child in his use of language. Apes are perhaps just on the verge of being able to use their signs in a truly symbolic way. In this sense, they're not human children, they're not adult humans, they're something very separate and distinct. Another thing we're interested in is the extent to which Chantek can learn concepts, like the concept of same or different. In this experiment, Chantek must sort the red objects from the blue. His success shows the ability to conceptualize different classes of objects. Chantek has been taught a system of barter. He is given metal tokens as a reward for successfully completing tests involving judgment and awareness. He trades these tokens for food and treats. The various ape language experiments have shown that apes can learn a few simple signs. But there is still great controversy as to how much understanding the apes have of the signs they use. Some consider the signing as no more than conditioned response, as in the case of the trained horse. Others think that apes show real understanding. For many, the evidence to date seems inconclusive. But one thing is clear. Sign language was invented by humans. It was the product of a society that took millions of years of human effort to develop. Apes on their own have not created language. In this experiment, Chantek must solve a series of problems that begin with retrieving a key using a magnet attached to a string. When he accidentally knocks the key onto the ground, Chantek solves this unexpected problem in his own way. Dr. Miles thinks this shows that Chantek is not performing some kind of circus trick, something he has learned simply by rote. She thinks it shows insight, and this seems to have become more developed with language training. A token has been nailed between two boards. To get at the token, Chantek must retrieve wire cutters to cut down a screwdriver which has been fastened to the fence. He must pry open the boards to get the token. Dr. Miles thinks that changes similar to those Chantek is undergoing under human training took place in our ape-like ancestors spontaneously over millions of years due to dramatic changes in their way of life.
as our ancestors, thinking becomes more and more abstract, our ancestors are able to conceptualize the world without having to make direct reference to it. In this sense, they maintain a mental image about relationships, about ideas, about categories of things, types of tools, types of foods, and these provide for abstract thinking. These experiments suggest that in our ape-like ancestors, the brain had already reached a stage where if conditions created the necessity, complex cognitive activity was possible. Human consciousness did not arise by miracle or accident. It had as its prehistory the mental development of animals, and in particular, that of our ape-like ancestors. In observations of present-day apes, perhaps we are seeing a mental development similar to that of our ancestors, before that walk on the savanna changed their way of life forever. This chimp is trying to work out a way to retrieve an orange. Chimps cannot swim or even float. He sees the connection between pulling the weeds and drawing the orange closer. But he has not thought of using a stick which would make his job easy. He finally gives up, somewhat bewildered. In this experiment, holes drilled in a log were filled with raisins. The log was left for the chimps. No training was provided. After picking out the raisins that were accessible with their fingers, a chimp begins to use a twig to spear the raisins. In the wild, chimps have been observed using twigs to fish for termites. But if deprived of these twigs, it would not greatly alter their way of life. The ape's relationship with nature does not depend on the use of these artificial implements. While this activity may show traces of the beginning of knowledge, no matter how developed, animal cognition is principally the product of instinct. It is not yet a rational, planned activity. I think the manipulative patterns that enable them to use objects as tools are instinctive. They are inborn. In other words, every chimpanzee in almost any situation will pick up and manipulate objects. It was Darwin who proved that man had evolved from a lower form of life, and in particular, man's descent from anthropoid apes. He discovered the mechanism of evolution, the law of natural selection. Nature necessarily favors those individuals in a species who, by chance, have characteristics that allow them to better adapt to the environment. These individuals will be more successful at reproducing and give rise to offspring who inherit this advantageous characteristic. Of course, a species may find a niche in the environment and remain relatively unchanged for millions of years. And in the game of natural selection, some species fail to adapt and become extinct. The modern ape and man were the result of separate branches of evolution arising from a common primate ancestor several million years ago. But what this common ancestor looked like is not really known. The fossil record is incomplete. 
Was it a knuckle walker, like the chin? Or closer to the gibbon? It is generally agreed that its main form of locomotion involved all four limbs. Like present day apes, it probably walked erect only on occasion. It is thought that a changing climate and a dwindling food supply forced an increasing hominid population out of the African forests and onto the plains of the savannah. These early hominids began to walk erect. This was the first decisive step in the transition from ape to man. Natural selection favored upright walking on the flat savanna. Bipedalism provided an increased range of vision, making it easier to identify predators and sources of food. It allowed these small hominids to appear larger when confronting enemies. The hands were released to better carry food. And perhaps most importantly, the hands were freed to use sticks and stones for digging up food and as weapons. A hand used for walking was transformed into a sensitive instrument for tool making. Tools once played as insignificant a role for our ancestors as in the life of the apes. But as these creatures left the protection of the forests, and walking upright left them relatively slower, and as individuals, less powerful, they came to increasingly rely on sticks and stones as a way of making better use of nature. But let's th consider this. Uh, running a four minute mile is only running 15 miles an hour. And to get re hit, re reach this speed, you have to have a specially trained human being who makes a huge effort to get to 15 miles an hour. Now, almost any old animal on the African savanna can run 35 miles an hour, a speed which is well over twice the speed that a human being can get to today. So somehow, in the earliest ancestors, the bipedal walking and whatever kind of tools they actually had gave a way of life which was so effective that it was more effective than the way of a chimpanzee represented by this cast here. And you notice this is a female, and you can see the size of her teeth as compared to the size of these uh, big fossil men with very, very much smaller teeth. And if this were an adult male, those teeth would be very substantially larger than uh, they are in the case of the, of the female. But Somehow, these creatures, with still with small brains, brains 400 to 500 cubic centimeters, a third the amount of brain that we have, uh, less than half of the brain that these uh, fossil men had, somehow, these are the ones that become our ancestors. I think the factor was tools, and I think that it's tools which make the beginning of the human way of life. These early humans' relationship with nature was becoming dependent on the use of tools to such an extent that it became the critical element in determining their relationship with each other. Their very survival depended on the cooperative use of tools. And because of this, something new began to play the decisive role in human development. The social element. Our primate ancestors were already gregarious creatures. With the first humans, this social characteristic began to play a qualitatively more significant role. More than being simple biological entities, people are social beings. By virtue of the fact that 
humans are the product of society, they are able to become extremely creative and active and dynamic, both in transforming the natural world around them and their very own society, such that they create a whole environment which is, in a sense, an artificial, man-made environment, and they leave their handprint on history in this fashion. Thus, the real significance of tool-making is that it shows human beings deliberately and dynamically transforming the face of nature, and in the course of doing so, developing society. Language is a consequence of this process from its earliest stages, but as it develops, it in itself provides a stimulus to its further development. The human threshold was crossed when people began to transform nature, and in so doing, they transformed themselves. The development of productive activity helped to bring the members of this emerging society closer together by increasing the need for joint activity and by making clear the advantage of this joint activity to each individual. The early humans lived in bands where they were social beings. Common work was dictated by the very character of the work tools which were so primitive, they virtually excluded successfully working on one's own. From this time, work had a social character. People had to cooperate. And the more they began to cooperate, the more they had to become clear in their minds that they had a common aim they wanted to reach. And to reach it, they must work together. People arrived at the point where they had something to say. The more they had to organize their activities, the more they had to say. They began to organize their work deliberately, to divide their labor into different activities, and to do this, they had to become conscious that the individual's activity was related to the common aim. With the use of the first work tools, people began to take a deliberate and active stand towards nature. The more active a stand people took towards nature, the more rapid and profound were the developments in terms of physiological changes. And the most important of these, of course, were the changes to the human brain.
the brain, the organ of thought. As the emerging society produced a storehouse of collective knowledge, there developed human consciousness. The result was the need for a larger and more sophisticated brain. As the relative size of the brain increased, areas of the brain dedicated to the production and understanding of language developed. What form did the first language take? It is likely that manual and vocal gestures preceded or facilitated the development of speech. Gesture still plays a role in human communication. But language relies on speech. It is through speech that precise meanings are conveyed. I've placed my cradle on yon hilly top And I as the wind blows my cradle will rock Oh hush a boy baby Oh, bonny little, and hush thy birdie, my bonny we do. Hush the human voice, oh, what will I do with its wide variety of inflection, subtle variations in the modulation of sound, is able to express a myriad of thoughts, emotions, and feelings. The increasing importance of language in the life of the humans was contributing to a dramatic change in the organ of speech, the larynx, a change which allowed for better control over the production of sounds. What we're looking at here is a reconstruction of what our earliest ancestors may have looked like. This drawing is based upon the skull of a hominid from South Africa, an Australopithecine, or literally southern ape man. The skull base of this hominid is very much like that of a living ape. We have reconstructed the upper respiratory tract of the animal to look like that of an ape. The larynx or voice box is positioned very high in the neck, able to make contact with the soft palate. What the high larynx will enable this animal, as with any other mammal to do, is to be able to breathe and swallow liquids almost simultaneously. Obviously, I can't breathe and swallow at the same time. What's happened? What has changed? What's changed is one of the most dramatic stories in human biology. It's a story of the total repositioning in the neck of the human voice box. What's going to happen is a gradual change, a descent in the throat of the human larynx. The movement of the larynx that took place over thousands of years of evolution seems to be repeated in the development of the larynx in the modern child over the course of a couple of years. A newborn human has the same configuration in its upper respiratory tract that we find in a dog or a cat or an ape. A newborn baby is able to breathe and swallow at the same time. In the mature vocal tract, the larynx has moved. Here you can see the tongue and here's the soft palate and the nasal region. Note how far removed the tip of the larynx, the epiglottis, is from the soft palate. Notice that the larynx can't interlock with the soft palate. There is thus a large space above the larynx. If we take a look inside the human larynx, we can see the vocal folds, the little ventricle, and the false vocal cords. When sounds are first made at the vocal cords, or vocal folds over here, the sound will come up, exit the larynx, and be modified to a great degree in this now free space that's formed by the larynx lowering into the neck. For the first time in mammalian history, there is now a common pathway for air and for food. In essence, we have gained the physical ability for fully articulate speech.
Animals live on what is ready made in nature. People live on what they create themselves. This is why natural laws govern the life of animals, while social laws determine the life of people. And it was in this creative, productive activity human thought was born, and with it, language. When one of our ancient ancestors found a piece of flint, he could imagine the tool he might fashion. Using imagination, he could draw on his past experience and on the experience of others. Experience shared with language. He could think to himself, here is a good piece of flint. It will make a good spear point. Of course, he would not think in these modern words, but he must have had some words with which he could express his thoughts. Out of the needs of their work came the need to know, to begin to understand nature in a conscious way. It was in work people learned to think. Side by side with the need to think came the need to speak. Language was born. Millions of years have passed since the first humans arose. Over this time, the gulf between human and animal has widened. The blind forces of nature 
govern the life of animals. For modern society, with its potential to understand the laws of nature, to harness nature to serve its aims, these blind forces no longer play the decisive role. Now it is the nature of society that governs the life of the humans. It is the character of society that determines whether people will fulfill their potential and deal with nature and each other in a planned and rational way. struggle of people like these and the millions upon millions who followed that gave rise to language and with it knowledge, science, human enlightenment. The birth of language was a point of departure from the animal kingdom a momentous turning point in human development.